All right, try it one more time. Good evening. My name, hi, oh, thank you. My name is Steve Sanders. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Maurer School of Law. I have the honor of standing in for our Dean Christy Ochoa, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Christy is a wonderful dean and a wonderful administrator. She also remains a dedicated scholar, and she's been in Washington, D.C. today presenting um, actually an award-winning paper that she first published in the Minnesota Law Review, and she's presenting today at a conference for the Environment Law Institute. So I'm here to welcome all of you on behalf of her. Um, this annual competition is named in honor, as most of you know, of Sherman Minton. Sherman Minton was a native of Indiana, a Hoosier. Uh, he was an Army veteran, a jurist, and uh, before all of that, a 1915 alumnus of this law school. He served in the U.S. Senate. He was a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago, and from 1949 to 1956, an associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Although his tenure was short, um, Justice Minton was able to participate in some of the landmark and the most important Supreme Court cases of the post-war era, including, in 1956, the unanimous opinion in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, this competition started out this year with 88 two L's. 88 students chose to participate. Um, it was narrowed down to 64, then 32, then 16, then 8. And since this is Indiana, tonight is the final four uh, that, you, that you get to see. Um, such a large number of students competing, and, and I should have said this, the whole competition is a really major event in the life of the law school. Moot court is an important experience for many students. And this evening, as you can tell by the enthusiastic group here tonight, is one of the major events in the calendar year in the life of the law school. So thank you for being with us. Um, this many people competing also requires um, a lot of judges. And so this year, uh, not counting our three distinguished jurists tonight. Uh, there were 75 judges who participated, uh, 56 of whom were alumni, uh, ranging from people who received their law degrees just within the last couple of years to uh, Jeffrey Slaughter, a justice of the Indiana Supreme Court, one of Justice Mass's colleagues, who just decided to show up and said, thought it would be a fun thing to come down with two of his law school classmates and judge an early round of moot court. And uh, I hear those students uh, got the same treatment that litigators in front of him at the Indiana Supreme Court gets, and they're not likely to, uh, to forget that. Um, and so we're, we're grateful to the judges, to the faculty, colleagues, as well as alumni and other local lawyers and jurists who assisted in the competition. Um, let me recognize three sponsors of this year's competition. Fagri Drinker, uh, the law firm of Stuart and Brannigan, and also the office of the Indiana Attorney General. Um, you'll be hearing in a second from Amani uh, 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 Khoury and my colleague Lane McFadden, who will give further introductions and thanks. But, uh, but I want to thank the 11 members of the advocacy board who really run the competition, the 33 members of the competition board who do invaluable service in all sorts of ways to keep the competition going, and the 20 uh, largely 1Ls, some of whom I see in the room, who served as bailiffs for the uh, early rounds of the competition. Finally, thanks are due to, as I said, my colleague, Professor McFadden, who's the faculty advisor to the Moot Court program, to the competition board, and a, a very experienced and distinguished appellate a practitioner in his own right, uh, Professor Cindy Cho, who I see sitting in the back, who assisted with developing and revising this year's program. Uh, Professor Jeff Stake, our, rel our, our resident statistician, for his program that assisted with the scoring of the early rounds of the competition. To uh, Marion Conaty and Paul Stiles, who were up here just a second ago, uh, who always provide dedicated and, and flawless technical support. This is being streamed, by the way, and will be on YouTube. Uh, and finally, to Chelsea Browning, our events director, who's in the back, without whom none of this could could happen, who sweats every detail of this competition from the uh, room reservation to the parking passes for the judges and everything in between. So uh, at this point, let me turn things over to my colleague, Professor McFadden. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Professor Sanders. It's so great to see so many people here in the Delaney Moot Courtroom. Um, I know this is the final four, but Dean McFadden also likes to call it the Super Bowl of law school. So I guess take your pick as to whatever uh, sporting event you're, 
I mean, it's basketball season, obviously, but um, this is such a, a huge deal, obviously, for our four, but not to stress you guys out, you'll be fine. Um, but <laughs> but uh, for the rest of us, I think this is a really nice celebration of the law school community. Um, it brings so many people together. It is the culmination of so much work. Professor Sanders gave you a sense of just how many people are, are really involved in making this happen. Um, you know, the two L's, this is the culmination of a year of work from them. They all take a class in the fall, and then 88 of them wrote an appellate brief, and did appellate arguments. Uh, it's uh, really an extraordinary thing. All of those 1Ls who volunteered all of their time to just watch and see what this was and to help people stay on time and uh, keep it all on track. And then the incredible number of 3Ls who had a good experience in Sherman Minton and have come back and have committed their time. And that includes everything. They, the 3Ls wrote the problem. They developed all the materials, the bench memorandum and the judicial opinion. They are the ones who reached out and contacted our alumni and faculty and made sure that every round had good prepared judges judges in it, and not just one, but multiple people, every night, night after night for five weeks, both online and in person. They handled all of the logistics of that, which is an unbelievable nightmare, the number of things you have to think about, uh, and they did, and they handled it with aplomb, often behind the scenes and unrecognized. I don't want that to go without recognition. It's an incredible amount of work, and I want to repeat what Professor Sanders said, which is to say thank you to those members of the bar, our alumni, members of the judiciary, and members of the faculty who did come and judge, who were prepared when they got here, who asked insightful and probing questions during the rounds, and who offered supportive and constructive feedback afterwards. And that means so much to our students. So many people come up to me and they say that turned out to be the thing that meant the most to me as a competitor was the experience of actually getting to hear from a practitioner who thought I was doing pretty well, which I wasn't entirely sure. And so that's really helpful. So thank you. Thank you uh, on behalf of those students and the advocacy board and the whole program here. I'm, I'm so pleased to be a part of this. I mean, perhaps you don't know that none of our peer institutions have an internal moot court competition of this scope and quality. I mean, we offer something truly exceptional here, and I'm really proud to have some small part in it. Um, I'm also honored to introduce now someone who has a very big part in it, uh, which is our Chief Justice of the Executive Advocacy Board. It's been such a delight working with her this year because whatever problem uh, arose, she had already known about it and was already planning to have it solved. I mean, this is a person who day in and day out is always thinking, is always helpful. I think probably all the members of the board feel the way that I do, which is that she did an exceptional job and is an exceptional person. I'm very happy to introduce Amanda. Annie Curry, our Chief Justice. Thank you, Professor McFadden, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as Professor McFadden mentioned, I have had the honor of serving as the Chief Justice of this year's Sherman Mitten Adv Advocacy Board. For the last year, the board has poured their hearts and souls into this competition, so I would like to start by thanking each of them. First, our executive competition coordinators, and I'd like you to stand while I thank you so everyone sees who you are. Um, Emily Peterson, our communications coordinator, handled all of the registration. <laughs> you can clap in a minute. <laughs> and, <laughs> and partner pairing for the competition, she acted as the point of contact for competitors and kept everyone apprised of the competition's progress through our social media. Emily Chris coordinated all of the logistics for our competition, making sure our competitors always had a room to argue in and judges who were fed, which is very important. And perhaps most importantly, she took on the very difficult task of coordinating the schedules of 64 very busy law students, which we are incredibly grateful for. And lastly, Wayne, our scoring coordinator, spent hours in Excel and our fair score program to ensure that all grading and scoring throughout the competition was equitable and thorough. Thank you all. And next, Kat and Caroline, our executive judge coordinators. I couldn't imagine two better people, two people better suited to bring attorneys and judges into this competition. They both sent hundreds of emails recruiting attorneys and greeted each judge with a smile as they walked into Mauer. And thanks to Kat and Caroline, each round of our competition provided competitors an opportunity to perform in front of a variety of really incredible attorneys. Thank you. And 
And Erica, our competition board coordinator, recruited one of the largest competition boards we have had in years. And she also recruited and trained our bailiffs throughout the competition and was, was always ready to volunteer as a bailiff herself. You'd be very hard pressed to find someone more willing to do anything to make this competition run smoothly than Erica was. Our problem coordinators, Lena, Shannon, and Wang Shi. They wrote the problem that you will hear argued tonight, and I cannot begin to explain the amount of work that goes into crafting a problem that 88 law students are going to go through with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> Um, and these three took that challenge head on and created an interesting, balanced, and creative problem and were very dedicated throughout this competition and Sherman Minton would not have happened without them. And then lastly, Sydney, our Associate Chief Justice. There are not enough words to describe Sydney's contributions to this competition and all of Maurer's advocacy competitions. After single-handedly running both of Maurer's internal trial competitions and the alternative dispute resolution competition, Sydney dove into Sherman Mitten and helped with every facet of the competition. She is our resident Excel expert, the best bailiff Maurer has ever seen, and the only reason I made it through in one piece. So thank you. I could not be more grateful. Each of you were really instrumental in making sure this making this competition a possibility. And I'd also like to assure everyone that next year's competition is in wonderful hands and announce that next year's advocacy board will led, be led by Chief Justice Ryan Day. I have a few more thank yous to get out. <laughs> We are very grateful to Dean Ochoa, Associate Dean Sanders, Dean McFadden, Director Beck, Marion Connedy and Paul Stiles, and Chelsea Browning and her team in the events office, Carly Clay and Jamie Foss. They were constantly available to answer our questions and help us work through issues, and their support, guidance, and positivity helped us through the most stressful parts of the competition. So thank you to you all. Additionally, we could not have put this competition on without the knowledge and support of our faculty advisor, Professor McFadden. He made himself constantly available, regularly spending his evenings and weekends at the law school and helped with every aspect of the competition. The board and I personally could not be more thankful for him and Maurer's advocacy programs would not be what they are today were it not for Professor McFadden's steadfast dedication to providing opportunities for Maurer students to develop their skills. And all the hours spent by the board were made worthwhile by our competitors this year. Over the last few weeks, the board and I have gotten to watch the competitors give their all to this competition and discover a passion for doing this kind of work. We have been so impressed by your dedication and spirit. And when we started this, we could not have envisioned the level of advocacy that you all have achieved. So we are now down to our final four competitors, Adam Rosenthal, Allison McBride, Lulu Falk, and Anne-Marie Bonds. And I know you're going to hear very incredible arguments from them tonight. Before we begin the final round, we'd also like to honor the top 32 competitors. These competitors excelled in both brief writing and their oral argument skills, if you all could stand. Congratulations and thank you all for your hard work. I also would like to let everyone know who received brief writing honors. Um, since there was a mistake in the program, we apologize for that. Uh, but quickly, the brief writing honors for the appellant were Nathan Blair and Emma Leonard, Stella Green and Julia Ragzek, and Aaron Hendricks and Emma Massa. And I believe I do not have the best brief winner down. Um, but there, there is another. <laughs> and on the other side, Parker McGuffey, Aiden Parker, Kenny Arnold, and Brandon Borgmenke, and Lulu Falk, and Ellie Barnes. <laughs> and
And quickly before we get started, this year's competition problem presented students with an opportunity to explore two niche areas of criminal law in the context of a dramatic fictional story set in the Dolly Parton themed West. For one issue, competitors tackled the complex and underdefined doctrine of Fourth Amendment standing in the context of the mail. And another issue presented competitors with a question of statutory interpretation and policy in the area of criminal restitution. The Good afternoon, councils. Um, court is convened today to hear argument in the matter of Michaela Dutton versus the United States of America. Each side will have 20 minutes in total, um, with the petitioners arguing first. You may proceed. Good evening, and may it please the court. My name is Alice McBride, and I represent the petitioner, Miss Michaela Dutton. This court has repeatedly recognized that the purpose of the Fourth Amendment is to protect people's rights to privacy and the freedom from unreasonable intrusions by the government. But the 14th Circuit's narrow approach does not further these goals effectively. It ignores the privacy interests of alias users and allows the government to conduct warrantless searches of their mail. This court should instead adopt the broad approach from the 5th, 7th, and 11th circuits that only requires a demonstrated connection to the alias itself. We urge the court to do so for two reasons. First, the broad approach is best grounded in our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, and second, it best effectuates the goals of the Fourth Amendment. Ms. McBride, should we be concerned at all on how the lower courts will uh, institute the rule, whether it's broad or narrow? We should be concerned about how lower courts will institute the rule. The broad approach prepares, gives, prepares lower courts with the best guidelines to actually implement, implement the rule and have consistent results. The other indicia approach is a multi-factor balancing test, and it is unclear how many factors are needed, how much they're weighted. However, the requirement to show a clear connection to the alias is much more straightforward and would be easier for lower courts to apply. Well, how clear does it have to be, counsel? Uh, is, does the alias have to be well known uh, in the community? And if so, you know, what, what's, what's the purpose of, of, of using an alias? No, Your Honor, exactly. That is why the established alias approach does not, is not the best approach here. We are, are under a broad approach. We just need some connection to the alias. So that can be, as stated in the for Fifth Circuit in United States v. Villarreal, that can be from a witness testifying that they've used the name before or a receipt bearing the name of the alias. That is all that required. Under the other and dish approach, that's where the established alias approach comes in. And that is an unclear and unnecessary approach. It leaves many alias users unprotected. And as you remarked, what's the point of using an alias if everyone has to know it? But here, the broad approach is grounded in an understanding that is recognized and permitted by society. 
an understanding that we can use aliases in the mail. Is it reasonable, though, for someone to make up any name that they want to and then expect Fourth Amendment protection? Yes, Your Honor, it is reasonable for them to use a their preferred name um, in the mail and, ex and expect Fourth Amendment protection because they still have the protection that they deserve as the intended recipient of the mail. So the broad approach is focusing on proving that the defendant is indeed the intended recipient of the mail by showing that connection with the alias. Isn't that a pretty fact sensitive inquiry rather than a clear test? It can be sensitive to the facts. However, it just requires some connection. And while this can be achieved in a multitude of ways, the, what the, the outcome is going to be clear and consistent across courts. If, counsel, if she, if she wanted the protection of the Fourth Amendment, why not use her own name? In this case, it is unclear for the record what her motivations were particularly in using other aliases. However, there are many reasons why a person might not use their name in the mail. For example, we could think of a celebrity who might want to avoid harassment, a government official with security concerns, or an ordinary consumer who's purchasing something online from a stranger. Well, her Just purpose here was, was to conceal uh, money laundering and federal felonies, was it not? That is likely and the Does case. that have any impact on the analysis? No, it does not. This court has established in McDonald versus United States and Kara versus California that the Fourth Amendment applies to the innocent and the guilty alike, to the proven offender and the law-abiding citizen. Here, the focus is on the use of the alias itself and Miss Dunn's expectation as the intended recipient of the package. It doesn't matter why she's using the alias or what's in the package. So does the state have some interest in this? In other words, uh, it would seem to make it more difficult for law enforcement, for example, to do their jobs. How would you address that? It could make it more difficult for law enforcement to do their job if a change in precedent incentivized criminals to continue to use aliases. But criminals aren't necessarily paying the most attention to Supreme Court precedent, and if they're using an alias to avoid law enforcement in the first place, they're going to be unlikely to change their behavior in the hope that if they're discovered and if the government doesn't have a warrant, then they'll be able to suppress the evidence. They're trying to evade law enforcement at any cost. What the Fourth Amendment does do it doesn't deter criminal conduct, but it deters misconduct by government officials. And the law enforcement must be deterred from repeating the conduct in this case. As Special Agent Epps testified on page 39 of the record, the FBI had no idea who Dolly Exotic was when they opened the package. They just assumed it was another fake name. But our criminal justice system cannot run on assumptions. Dolly Exotic could have been a real person. It could have been a fake name. They didn't know and they didn't check. If we do not grant Ms. Dunn standing in this case, the court rewards that assumption. Did it make any difference to them who she was? It, would, it should make a difference to law enforcement who she was because that would depend on if she would have standing in the package, if it was her real like legal name, there would not be a question in this case that she would have had well, standing you, over the package. I'm sorry, but you talked about misconduct, police mm -hmm. misconduct. Mm -hmm. So presumably that would go past the standing issue and maybe that's too broad of a question here, uh, such that, well, they're opening this package without any reason, but they had counterfeit or, st excuse me, stolen $100 bills, right? And that, that does go to the reasonableness of the search itself. In this case, the district court limited its fact finding to the issue of standing alone. So we so, shouldn't concern ourselves with that. Is that what you're saying? It should still be, the, the court should still be concerned about it um, in the sense that if Ms. Dunn is not granted standing, we can't even get to the step of determining if it's reasonable, if there was law enforcement misconduct in this case. And if there was misconduct, her rights will never be vindicated. I guess help me understand if we're at the narrow issue of standing, what's the misconduct that we're worried about here? The misconduct does come from the warrantless searches of packages. So at the issue of standing is whether the defendant even has the chance to contest, to vindicate their rights, to have their day in court, to say that the government messed up, they shouldn't have done that, they violated my rights. 
Counsel, you urge that the court abandon this uh, other indicia approach. Um, what would you substitute in its place? And would the net result uh, of your test simply to be uh, simply turn out to be Fourth Amendment protection for all aliases in all circumstances? We urge the broad approach requires some connection. If an alias user is able to prove their connection with their alias, they would receive protection from the Fourth Amendment. And that's how is that any different from the other indicia test? Or the, is it just a matter of degree? The other indicia a test requires reference to property like concepts. But as this court established in Rockus v. Illinois, a legitimate expectation of privacy can come from reference to either understandings that are permitted by society or reference to property concepts. The other indicia approach is focused on solely property concepts. It makes a sufficient condition necessary. Thank you. Good evening, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Lulu Falk, and I represent the respondent the United States of America in today's proceeding on the issue of standing. Your Honors, this is a case about preserving the legitimacy of our criminal justice system. Courts have long recognized the need for avoiding unreasonable expectations of privacy in the context of Fourth Amendment protections of search and seizure. We ask that you affirm the judgment of the circuit court in today's proceeding on the issue of standing because it is clear that Ms. Dutton lacks the requisite Fourth Amendment protections necessary to challenge the searches of packages that were linked to criminal ends. Counsel, why, why didn't she have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy? Let's, uh, let's say we're in uh, 19th century Hartford and a struggling novelist named Samuel Clemens um, has packages delivered to his home, um, and this is before any of his novels really hit it big. Um, are you suggesting that uh, the packages sent to Mark Twain would would have no Fourth Amendment protection, but the Clemens packages would? Um, no, I am not, Your Honor. Uh, there is a key distinction between a package being sent to a home in which there is some sort of possessory interest, some kind of reasonable expectation that society is prepared to deem reasonable. And here, there is no connection to a home address. There is a connection to the 9 to 5 ranch, which is linked to criminal ends in this case. She's working there and she's expecting a package. Why does she have no expectation of privacy in that package simply because it's coming to another name? Well, for multiple reasons, Your Honor. Uh, while it is certainly the case that Miss Dutton has some connection to the address of the 9 to 5 ranch, this fact is not dispositive on her having an expectation of privacy. Um, thus, like the defendant in United States v. Morta, who was unable to prove anything further than this and actually a better connection to the address in that case, one in which she was living at the home for which the illicit package was sent, um, it is unlikely that Miss Dutton can prevail here in showing anything other than a non-private tie to the 9 to 5 ranch. Um, that would also not give rise to an expectation of privacy in that package. Ms. McBride suggests that the uh, test that they advocate for is rooted in the Fourth Amendment. What do you say to that? I would say, Your Honor, that the broader approach as uh, advocated by my opposing counsel today is one that would not only provide for a test that is vague because most of the language that is used in the case law of broader approaches deem that a defendant has an expectation of privacy merely when they are deemed, quote, in effect to be their criminal alias. And that is language from United States v. Richards. That is a weak connection test that when applied to all citizens in the United States would likely incentivize criminals to actually use criminal aliases when sending or receiving packages. Because if it were the case that merely a weak connection is all that is necessary for there to be an expectation of privacy, then what would prevent uh, criminals from using this methodology in the future and merely saying that they have this kind of weak connection, uh, whether it's through a receipt or someone that might have been conspiring with them to send or receive criminal illicit goods? Why wouldn't the criminal purpose of the alias just be an after-the-fact justification for opening the package? So 
It wouldn't be an after the fact justification, Your Honor, because in addition to the long held conception of Fourth Amendment rights as a constitutional protection that must be afforded in legitimate or reasonable circumstances, there are many aliases that could have been used in the past as a means for criminal ends. And in this case specifically, for example, it is not an after the fact justification with regard to the Annie Oakley package, because in fact, the Annie Oakley alias was used in the past from 1999 to 2002 on multiple occasions to engage in criminal acts. And therefore, at the time of the search, which is the standard that we use when evaluating when there is an expectation of privacy, legal enforcement were aware of this criminal use. And thus it wasn't an after the fact justification, but rather an understanding of what this, what this alias actually meant and what the connection there was between Miss Dutton and the Annie Oakley name. Well, she never used Dolly Exotic in connection with any kind of crime. She, she knew she was Dolly Exotic. Why does it matter that very few, if anyone else, knew that she was? And, and I have a follow-up to that. And I'm sorry, wasn't Annie Oakley the criminal purpose wholly unrelated to this criminal purpose? Um, I'll take the first question, uh, Your Honors. But with regard to uh, the Dolly Exotic package first, so there is no expectation of privacy in that package specifically because, as you've noted in your question, there were not a sufficient understanding of the public that Miss Dutton actually was Dolly Exotic. Well, well, how many would it take? Ten people to know she's Dolly Exotic? A hundred? I mean, so under the uh, the other indicia approach, which it is our contention is the favorable approach uh, today in giving rise to an expectation of privacy, it is the line drawing there would be that the defendant must show that at least two people, the public, is aware of this use and there is a connection that would show that Miss Dutton is understood to be Dolly Exotic. And here in the record, it is, sa it is said that only a few friends on page six of the record understood her to actually be Miss Dutton. And given that it is Miss Dutton's burden to actually show that su uh, sufficient people understand her to be her alias, there is only one specific person, Bonnie Cassidy, who is cited as actually understanding her to be this alias. And therefore, this is an insufficient showing of an established alias under the other indicia approach, but it is also um, not satisfying of the broader approach as well, because the weak connection between Miss Dutton and her Dolly Exotic alias is undermined by the physical appearance of the package, as well as the fact as of her effectively abandoning the package when she rode off into the sunset with her horses the day of the FBI raid. All right. And it is also clear with regard to the broader approach of the other circuits that it is still the case that Miss Dutton would lack a legitimate expectation of privacy regarding the Annie Oakley package. Under the broader approach, as noted before, the fact that there is some connection, as we concede, between Miss Dutton and this name is not dispositive on whether there is an expectation of privacy uh, because Miss Dutton effectively abandoned the package addressed to Annie Oakley. Miss Dutton is thus similar to the defendant in United States v. Campbell, who did not have an expectation of privacy because both defendants have gone to great lengths to distance themselves from these alternate names. How far does that have to go? Some type of um, affirmative uh, disclaimer of the name? What does that mean? Um, Your Honor, it might be. I, I, with regard to whether it is understood by society that someone is referred to as this alias, the subjective intent or manifestations of the defendant does matter in a limited degree. And this is an, one example. So if we have Sean Love Holmes, Sean Puffy Holmes, Puffy P Daddy, <laughs> Diddy, which one of those are we? Or the, or the uh, artist formerly known as Prince? Uh, where, do, where do we draw that line? Where do, yeah, when it comes to uh, general nicknames, the other indicia approach is an attractive approach for that very reason, because we understand that there is a social practice and norm of having nicknames, alter egos that are recognized by society. So with your example there, there would likely be, uh, specifically with the P. Diddy example, there would likely be a societal acknowledgement of this nickname or alter ego that greatly outweighs the kind of societal acknowledgement in this case today. Speaking of society, Council, I'm, I'm having a hard time grasping what societal interest is served by denying Fourth Amendment protection 
to this petitioner. I mean, she clearly um, expected these packages to arrive for her. So what societal interest is, is served by overlooking the warrant requirement of the Fourth Amendment? The societal interest that is served, Your Honor, has to do with reasonability and what society is prepared to accept as reasonable. And when it comes to law enforcement and the enforcement of our law, it is important that we only protect packages that have this expectation of privacy. And privacy is important for all citizens of the United States. Let me emphasize that. But under Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, a reasonable and legitimate expectation of privacy is required to have standing. If this court were to ignore the criminal ends at at hand today that become aware at the time of searches in the future, then the effect of such a precedent may protect far more criminal acts than are already founded and incentivize alias use for the concealment of criminal goods. Additionally, so what if it was delivered someplace with absolutely no connection to P. Diddy or whoever? Um, would that make a difference? Uh, there could be still an ex expectation of privacy, Your Honor. Um, with with regard to the other indicia approach, if there are other um, factors such as a possession and ability to possess that package, uh, I see I'm out of time, may I finish your honors? Sure. Uh, if there are any other factors related to whether it's public acknowledgement and establishment of that alter ego or the ability to possess that package at a, a facility, for example, then that would also be sufficient to give rise of an expectation of privacy. And for the foregoing reasons, we ask that you affirm the judgment of the circuit court. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, rebuttal, Ms. McBride. Ms. McBride, suggesting we uh, accept the United States position and adopt their approach. Can you still win under that test? Yes, we can still win because the 14th Circuit improperly applied the other in dish approach. As the Ninth Circuit said in the United States v. Morda, it's supposed to look to the totality of the circumstances. Here, Ms. Dunn, though she did not own or live at the 95 Ranch, she was there over 80 hours a week. Additionally, she had an opportunity to control any packages coming to the ranch. Part of her official job duties were to control shipping packages, and that's on page eight of the record. Additionally, she has historical use of the property. She has had personal items and groceries delivered to the ranch to Miss Stutton. And as established on page 41 of the record, she had books sent to one of her aliases, Dolly Exotic. When we look at the totality of these circumstances, there are sufficient other indicia that connect Miss Stutton with these packages. Additionally, Miss Stutton never abandoned these packages. They were never delivered. They were seized by the government. They never did a controlled delivery. They instead decided to proceed to a search warrant. How could she abandon them if it was never even had the opportunity to be delivered in the first place? In conclusion, Miss Dunn has demonstrated that these are her aliases and these are her packages and that is her rights that are at stake. That is what our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence requires. Thank you. Council. Move on to the Fourth Amendment issue. Oh, excuse me, to the restitution issue. I'm sorry. Council, proceed. Good evening, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Adam Rosenthal, and I represent the petitioner in this case, Ms. Michaela Dutton. Congress enacted restitution procedures to help restore federal crime victims to their prior state of well-being. But these procedures only permit restitution when an individual is harmed by the specific conduct for which a defendant is convicted. This court should affirm the 14th Circuit's judgment regarding restitution for two reasons. Mr. Rosenthal, where do you find that in the statute itself? Find what, Your Honor? The that, it, <laughs> that it has to be in relation to the... Uh count of conviction? Um, it's, it does not appear in the statute, but this court in Huey explained that... Uh, well, but is the, is the statute uh, vague or is it ambiguous? It seems to be pretty straightforward. Yes, Your Honor. The statute is ambiguous with regards to what is meant by offense. So in Huey, this court explained that restitution is only proper when the losses are caused by the specific conduct 
that serves as the basis for the conviction of offense. But this statute says, and it's got a subordinate clause there, says including, comma, in the case of an offense that involves as an element, scheme, conspiracy, or pattern of criminal activity. So was there, was she charged with a conspiracy here? No, Your Honor, that would be the 1990 amendment that Congress enacted uh, after this court's decision in Huey, and that only involves uh, you're saying this statute here is was not in effect. It was not extant at the time. Nine, uh, so sec the section you're referring to, Section A2, only refers to those offenses that have an, as an element a uh, conspiracy scheme or pattern of criminal activity. Here, Ms. Dutton was only convicted for exotic animal trafficking and money laundering, and neither of those offenses has as an element uh, one of those things. So in, in that sense, then, only when a, the offense of conviction has as an element one of those things can a court order restitution for conduct unrelated to the conviction of offense. So under your theory, could any restitution be, be ordered here? The, the, the offense is uh, importation of ostrich eggs, right? Not, it, correct, Your Honor, not for the offenses that Ms. Dutton pled guilty to, but those were not the only charges that were originally brought. Um, in the original indictment, Ms. Dutton was also charged with resisting arrest. Uh, if the government had kept the resisting arrest charge, then that conduct could have been sufficient to uh, cause the harm that Mrs. Zhao suffered. But uh, under the sentencing guidelines, isn't this what we would refer to as relevant? Excuse me, relevant conduct, sort of within the the race just of the crime itself. I mean, she's she's committing the, the crime of illegal importation, and while she flees. Uh, from apprehension for that crime ends up uh, horrendously damaging uh, the Jean Miami ranch. Why, why is the ranch owner not a victim, a crime victim here as contemplated by Congress? Your Honor, the fact that Ms. Dutton was charged with resisting arrest suggests that there was conduct that occurred after her exotic animal trafficking and her flight from the police. The more, uh, the better approach is uh, to restitution is the elemental approach adopted by the 14th Circuit because it establishes a clear outer limit of restitutionary liability and it also provides district court judges with a consistent standard during sentencing. Uh, as I discussed earlier, Huey left open the question of what is meant by offense. Uh, th this, this Did Congress fill that in at all post Huey? No, Your Honor. They, they define victim, but that does not define, again, what offense means. Um, this would establish, again, this would provide a consistent Well, but didn't they, didn't they define victim in the, in the parlance of, of uh, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry, um, proximate causation? <laughs> yes, and Your isn't Honor. this proximately caused? No, Your Honor, because again, before you get to the direct and proximate cause analysis under Section A2, uh, a district court first has to begin with the offense in Section A1A. Um, and, and Congress did not, when it, when it enacted the amendment in 1996 uh, in Section A2, it, and, and nowhere in the legislative history is there any suggestion that Congress intended to broaden the scope of restitution. In the Senate report recommended- Why are, why are we going to the Legislative History Council? Uh, can't we just read the plain language of the statute and apply it? No, Your Honor, because again, it, it defi the, the statute defines victim. It does not define offense. Um, so, so this court, uh, again, it, established that limitation in Huey, and the government reads the statute, uh, the, the 1996 amendment, as broadening the scope of restitution beyond uh, the limitation in Huey, but the legislative history doesn't support that. Uh, so and, how does that lead to consistent re, um, results for the trial court? Uh, it leads to consistent results because uh, in the Senate report recommending passage of the act that was a part of the A2 amendment, Congress didn't want to turn the sentencing phase of criminal trials into a, a determination of facts and issues better suited for civil proceedings. In this sense, then, a fact-specific approach that all of the conduct related to the offense of conviction implicates the concerns that Congress, uh, Congress discussed in that report. But requiring a district court judge to first look at the elements allows consistency in that an individual cannot be ordered to pay restitution for conduct in one circuit that a, court, that a district court judge determines to be the proximate cause of harm and not so in another circuit because those judges don't get to determine the fact specifics of the conduct but rather look at the elements of the offense. Could there ever be any consistency with trying to determine proximate cause? Uh, so with proximate cause, again, that is, that's the concern that Congress 
that was one of Congress's main concerns, which is why the elemental approach is, is better suited for those needs. Uh, on it, the district court already has to get into direct and proximate cause once it determines uh, what conduct is covered as the offense. In that, can, in that sense, then, if, if the proper approach to determining what constitutes the offense also includes proximate cause, then district court judges have to engage in two different proximate cause analyses, which is bound to lead to some inconsistency. Um, restitution is designed to be restorative. Won't this leave a whole lot of people without any restoration? No, Your Honor, because it, it, it's looking at the facts of this case, there were two instances by which the government could have secured restitution for Mrs. Zhao. Again, if it had not agreed to dismiss the resisting arrest charge, it could have re secured restitution for her through the conduct involved in that. Huey explained that victims aren't exempt from the plea bargaining process. And also so under Section A3, a court can order restitution to an individual who doesn't meet the statutory definition of a victim if it's agreed to in the plea agreement. The government did not do, did not pursue either of those avenues in this case. And now because of this prosecutorial oversight, it attempts to bypass the chain of causation and, and associate the harm that Mrs. Zhao suffered uh, with conduct that was unrelated to her conviction of offense. So you're saying this was a strategic error on the part of the prosecutor? Uh, I, I won't guess the, the motivations of the prosecution, but if they wanted to ensure that restitution would be ordered, they wouldn't have dismissed the resisting arrest charge as part of the plea agreement. So United States v. Washington, the 11th Circuit, says that an escaping bank robber had to pay restitution for injuries caused during his flight from police. Is that, that case was wrongfully decided? No, Your Honors. The 11th Circuit in Washington, as well as the 7th Circuit in Donaby, have noted the special context of robbery and that flight is a pattern of the commission of that offense. In a certain sense, no robbery can be completed without some kind of flight. Uh, there's also a continuity of purpose, and that even if the individual is trying to escape law enforcement, um, they still have that purpose of trying to complete the robbery. So trying to, um, a need to elude the police is a likely and foreseeable outcome of the commission of that crime. What kind of flight did Mr. Bankman Freed have? <laughs> um, there be, should there be any restitution there? And, and what, for, for whom, Your Honor? Uh, Bankman Freed with his, uh, his uh, Bitcoin. Um, um, I'm unaware of the theft. specifics of that case, <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor. Um, so, so, so the rationale of Washington holds up because, it, because we would expect bank robbers to flee, but we wouldn't expect other federal criminals to try to evade arrest? Uh, again, with reg I see that my time is about to lie. Can I finish yes, your question, please? So a need to elude the police isn't a foreseeable outcome of exotic animal trafficking. So they don't, district court judges don't need to get into those factual considerations that again, Congress warned against in passing A2 when it comes to robbery, because that flight is going to be there every time. Thank but, you, counsel. Thank you. Good evening, Your Honors, and may it please the court. My name is Anne Marie Bonds, arguing on behalf of the United States on the issue of restitution. I'm sorry, Barnes? Bonds. Bonds. Like James Thank Bond, you. but with an S. All right. Uh, <laughs> Congress passed and amended the Victim and Witness Protection Act as a way to restore victims for their physical, emotional, and economic harms they received due to criminal activity. Here, the 14th Circuit misinterpreted the VWPA under its current statutory language and severely limited the ability for victims to be restored by adopting a narrow element-based approach. Couldn't a, a victim look to the common law, some type of, uh, for example, a tort to, to make themselves whole? That is correct, Your Honor. Um, civil remedies are available here. However, it's the whole reason the VWPA was passed was because those civil remedies were not an adequate alternative. Um, Why? For, because there are severe time and money barriers to civil remedies. For example, here, the Zhao's had their entire home <coughs> destroyed and their, meaning, their meanings of making money and, and uh, making a living wage. Um, so how would they be able to afford a lawyer? How would they be able to afford a year-long process of a tort suit against Ms. Dutton? I mean, for that matter, how would, uh, they, they could be in a long list of creditors uh, against Ms. Dutton for other issues. I know she has been convicted of money laundering, so. Should that be our concern? Sorry? Should that be our concern? It should be the concern of what was Congress's intent when passing the VWPA. Um, and Congress's intent was to have an easier and shorter, more um, 
succinct process that is in conjunction with the criminal sentencing so that victims don't have to be re-traumatized and go through a years-long process to be restored. Counsel, do, do you lose if the Huey precedent is upheld and applied? No, Your Honor. And, and, and why not? Has, has, has it been effectively overruled by subsequent congressional action? So we're not asking here to overrule Huey, simply asking that the congressional amendment into the VWPA, specifically the uh, definition of victim, adding in a direct and proximate causal requirement, does limit its application to the VWPA. The Huey still has its um, effect on other restitution statutes. There are other statutes that don't have that causal requirement that Huey is still good law so for. So explain how the new statutory language uh, enables this recovery. Yes, so the new statutory language defines a victim as a person who is directly and proximately harmed as a result of the commission of an offense for which restitution may be ordered. It's very important here of the use of commission of an offense because by putting in commission, Congress intended a broader interpretation of who can be a victim. And as the United States versus Chalupnik, which is an Eighth Circuit case, took, took a look back at the Senate Judiciary Committee notes, noted that the word commission reflects an intent to include the defendant's total conduct in committing the offense. Now, and, how do lower courts Courts, um, figure out this proximate cause. So proximate cause is related to uh, reasonable foreseeability, and there's also a but-for cause requirement. That's the direct cause. So there's but-for cause and proximate cause, which is foreseeability. However, this is very similar to the causation requirements in civil suits and tort actions. So courts are already in the process of understanding what but-for cause and proximate cause looks like in a variety of situations. So courts would be consistent in determining who caused what. You're saying that in, in the tort uh, realm that there's consistency in those courts? <laughs> Maybe not a general consistency, but there there is a, a large amount of tort suits in the United States. So courts are frequently applying this rule. They're frequently applying this standard, so they can also apply it effectively here. Okay, so how how was the ranch proximately caused by Dutton's commission of exotic animal trafficking. Yes, so in uh, opposing counsel's argument, um, he argued that it was the exotic animal trafficking of the eggs. However, that is not in the record. It's simply exotic animal trafficking. And part of exotic animal trafficking, a violation of 18 USC 42, is the uh, transportation of animals across continental state lines. When the FBI came to raid the nine to five ranch, Miss Dutton was leading three ostriches away and into a pen. We can, uh, we can see that she was in the process of the exotic animal trafficking at the time of the FBI raid. Um, and also, in terms of commission of an offense, Congress defined commission of an offense to include immediate flight after the commission of a crime. So her flight from police is part of her commission of exotic animal trafficking as well. That's uh, 18 USC 3673. So the 14th Circuit suggests that there's a split in circuits on this analysis of the statute and that that's evidence that the statute itself is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Does that analysis work? So the statute is not the statute is not ambiguous for purposes of the rule of lenity. Um, it noted that if they hadn't adopted the elemental approach, they would have adopted the rule of lenity. But as this court has noted, the rule of lenity is a very, very high bar, and the standard is not ambiguity. The standard is grievous ambiguity. Um, so the standard is if you look at both the plain language of the statute, the structure of the statute, its legislative history, and congressional intent, and the courts are still basically just guessing as to what Congress intended, then the statute is grievously ambiguous. We don't have that here because we know what commission of an offense means to Congress, and we also know um, the Senate Judiciary Committee notes from the United States versus Chalupnik case. But let's say lenity did apply. Would the government win here? Well, if lenity did apply, then it would be reading in the narrower um, reading, interpretation of the statute. So that would be the elemental approach. However, um, Lenity simply doesn't apply here because there is no grievous ambiguity. And it's it's important to note that, yes, this is a high monetary penalty for Ms. Dutton, but um, there have been times where uh, this court has noted that a statute is ambiguous when it's a criminal statute on the line, it's a defendant's liberty and their freedom on the line, but yet they refuse to invoke the rule of lenity because it's not grievously ambiguous. But if you're talking uh, several times now about congressional intent and so on and so forth, that to me just screams <coughs> ambiguousness, mm -hmm. that we can't just look at the, at the uh, rule of the statute. How is it not ambiguous? Because it, it can be ambiguous on its face. There is a, a circuit split here, so um, the government will concede that there is an amb ambiguity in how circuit courts have interpreted this statute. 
However, the, the rule is not ambig simple ambiguity. The rule is grievous ambiguity. So you have to do the investigation into the legislative history and purpose of the statute before finding that it was grievously ambiguous. So that's why the, the Senate Judiciary Committee notes are so helpful here. So and I'm sorry, you're saying that it's ambiguous the way it's been construed by the circuits or that it itself is ambiguous? Well, it dep it's ambiguous in how circuit courts have construed it. So some circuit courts in adopting the elemental approach have taken a look at Huey and seen that Huey still applies after the amendment um, in 1996 to the VWPA, while some have found that the amendment, for example, the Washington case, Donaby case from the Seventh Circuit, that the amendment essentially makes it so that Huey is not applicable to the VWPA anymore because the specific conduct language in the Huey, in the Huey case and the broad interpretation of who is a victim under the VWPA is, is simply conflicting. Now, so why didn't the government just avoid this problem by not pleading away the resisting charge? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I can't speculate on what the trial prosecutors wanted to do in terms of dropping the resisting arrest charge. It is true that by keeping the resisting arrest charge, the causation might have been simpler, it might have been easier to connect Ms. Dutton's conduct or the commission of the resisting arrest to the harm that the Zhao family had. However, um, it's important to note that Ms. Dutton also benefited greatly from this plea agreement. She had multiple charges dropped, um, and so that was that was a, a benefit for her. Um, also, the, uh, civil, the restitution under this statute is not saying that Ms. Dutton is guilty of resisting arrest. Um, that, that's why restitution, the burden of proof, is preponderance of the evidence and not beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So by saying that Ms. Dutton's flight from police was a part of her commission of exotic animal trafficking, we're not saying that she is guilty of resisting arrest. Um, also, I'd like to point out the 14 circuits note and uh, counsel for Ms. Dutton's note that it potentially, by adopting the broader rule, this could be more punitive than restorative. However, we have, we have four circuits here who have used the proximate cause language for multiple decades, and we have no evidence that the circuit courts who use that language have more restitution orders or that they have a higher amounts of restitution when they do order it. So there is no real evidence that restitution is being used more when, when using the broader approach. Also, there are other limiting mechanisms built into the statute to ensure that, rest, that restitu restitution is the primary purpose is restoration rather than punishment. For example, um, Section A1B, trial courts are required to take a look at the defendant's ability to pay, their ability to make money, and the amount of dependents that they have depending on them. And if the trial court finds that um, the defendant is not able to pay the restitution order, then they cannot, they cannot order restitution. So those mechanisms built into the statute are already ensuring that the purpose of restitution is to be restorative and not punitive. Um, in conclusion, the broader direct and proximate cause approach here is the proper approach, and the limited elements-based approach is not, is not appropriate and does not correctly interpret the VWPA under its current statutory language. Therefore, the 14th Circuit's order on restitution should be reversed, and the trial court's order on restitution should be reinstated. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. The government suggests that it was Congress's intent to broaden the, sco broaden the scope of uh, restitution under the A2 amendment, but the Senate report that the government cites does not, does not support that argument. The two main purposes of this act was one, to increase restitution by making certain offenses subject to mandatory restitution orders, and by creating a consistent procedure across the different restitution provisions. Thus, A2 is more, no more than a codification of a consistent language across both the permissive. Counsel, how do we, it, it seems, it, it, it sounds to me like you're using the congressional record to inject ambiguity into a statute that, that looks pretty plain to me on its face. It says proximate, proximately caused. And how is this not proximately caused, this injury here? Uh, again, Your Honor, it's not the proximate cause, but more the definition of offense. And it wasn't foreseeable in the same way. Uh, it wasn't for a foreseeable event that simply by throwing open a, a, a gate to an ostrich pen that they would stampede two miles away and destroy the ranch. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just one thing, Mr. Rosenthal, is, is there a site to the record for this um, intent that you say doesn't say what she says it says? Yes, if you look at the purpose of the, of the Senate just, is, is there a site to the record? Um, no, it's not in the record, but thank you. Right, thank you. Case is submitted. <clears throat> Let us know when they've made it.
Please uh, socialize, mingle, and have some refreshments. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.
Um, before we announce uh, the winners tonight, I want to uh, uh, allow my colleagues and myself to inter introduce ourselves uh, to you briefly. So I'll start with Judge Kenworthy. I am Dana Kenworthy, and I've been a judge on the Indiana Court of Appeals since January of last year, so about 15 months now. I smell food. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm Jim Sweeney, and I'm on the uh, Federal District Court for the Southern District of Indiana. Cindy? And uh, I'm Mark Massa, and uh, as of last Monday, I've been a, an Associate Justice on the Supreme Court of Indiana for 12 years. So um, went to college and lived right next door in a building that has since been torn down, but uh, it's great <laughs> great to, to finally be here at, uh, at Maurer. Um, let me just say on behalf of my colleagues, what an outstanding presentation by all four of you. And I'm sure you've heard the cliche and know there are no losers um, in a competition like this. Very difficult decision. All four of you were absolutely outstanding um, and could argue in front of us tomorrow. And, and, I'm, and, and I sincerely mean that. So um, it's my honor to uh, to present to you the winners of the 2024 Sherman Minton Moot Court competition, Allison McBride and Lulu Falk. Say thank you as well. Uh, as Justice Master said, it, it was not an easy decision for us. Um, you all did great, but so too did the coordinators and the uh, our minders, uh, so to speak, uh, the <laughs> Chief Justice, Associate Justice, the bailiff, uh, um, Professor Sanders, McBride, uh, the audience, 64 participants that didn't make it this far, but started out here. It's really amazing. Uh, and, and the scenario that was written was awesome. So thank you all and, and the audience as well. Yeah. I echo those comments as well and would just point out that I'm a lifelong Hoosier and an, an alum of McKinney and proud to be among all of you here at the law school. Um, we have our bailiff extraordinaire over there. Nyla did a phenomenal job for us and truly all four of you were amazing. Um, the way you handled the humor from that end of the bench was really good. <laughs> quick on your toes and you pivoted well. So uh, very proud of you and, and appreciate the invitation to be here. <laughs>